Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jeremy Leffler, and I work in the Policy Office at the National Science Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another session of the NSF Virtual Grants Conference. And I'm pleased now to present this session, which will cover the programs in the NSF Directorate for Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships, or TIP. This session will be presented by Barry Johnson. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Barry Johnson. I'm Division Director for the Division of Translational Impacts within NSF's new Directorate for Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships. I'm delighted to be a part of the Virtual Grants Conference. Uh, look forward to giving you an overview of TIP, as we call it, and also answering questions that you have at the end. So welcome, and uh, I very much look forward to interacting with you. Thank you for being here. Again, my contact information is listed here, uh, my title, my name, uh, the directorate uh, name and division name, uh, obviously all part of the National Science Foundation. I think this is an incredibly important time in the life of our nation and society. It's really a pivotal, pivotal moment for our nation and society. We're dealing with many uh, grand challenges, climate change being one of those, equitable access to education, healthcare, and other, other capabilities, uh, critical and resilient infrastructure being important uh, to our country as well. And so in this moment, uh, NSF has created a new directorate called the Directorate for Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships to help our nation address some of these most challenging issues. And I want to describe for you today a little bit about the directorate, the programs that we operate uh, give you the information that you need to seek out those programs, uh, potentially apply to those programs. And again, I'll answer any questions that you have at the end. In addition to the challenging time that we live in, it's really a changing uh, science and engineering enterprise uh, that we need in order to meet the challenges of the moment. What we're finding in uh, science, uh, engineering, and math, and technology in general is that the pace of discovery is accelerating. Uh, data science and new emerging technologies are helping to accelerate that. Uh, we have an increasing demand for the activities that we as a, a, the National Science Foundation support to have societal and economic impact. Uh, we want to get more out of the you know, the investments that we make in basic research. Uh, we want to translate the results of that basic research into societal in impact and do so in a way that helps our nation's um, economy, our nation's competitiveness, uh, and, and the capabilities that we can bring to the table to solve some of these very challenging problems. We also need partnerships in order to uh, achieve our goals. Uh, we cannot do this by ourselves. It's important that we as an organization uh, and, and our universities and others that are part of our community leverage partnerships to achieve the, the objectives that we want and to solve the problems that we have in society. NSF has been in existence since 1950. Uh, it was created by Congress in that time frame, so we've been around more than 70 years. If you look at the mission statement for the National Science Foundation, you'll see that it begins with promote the progress of science. And that's certainly critical to the mission that we achieve and, and execute. Uh, but it also goes on to state reasons for promoting the progress of science. And it's to enhance the nation's health, welfare, prosperity, and to secure the nation's defense. So we promote that progress of science but we do so with a purpose. Uh, and the new directorate that we've created, TIP, uh, is central to that purpose. If you look at engineering, uh, if you look at the National Science Foundation, prior to uh, the development of the new TIP directorate, uh, we had seven directorates and several offices that address some of the activities that we support, biological sciences, engineering, mathematical and physical sciences, computer and information science and engineering, the geosciences, our Office of Integrative Activities. We have a Directorate of Education and Human Resources, a Directorate of Social, Behavioral and Economic Sciences, and we have an Office of International Science and Engineering. 
all focused on that mission statement that I provided just a moment ago. Now we introduce a new directorate, the first new directorate in more than 30 years, uh, the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate being the, the last one to be created. Uh, we now have the Directorate for Technology, Innovation and Partnerships, and it's really focused on those elements that I mentioned previously, translating ideas out of basic research, creating a more innovative uh, culture and environment within our nation's science and engineering ecosystem, and leveraging partnerships to achieve this. And so what I want to go through is talk a little bit more about TIP as a directorate, but then drill down and describe specific programs that we're operating on behalf of our nation. And so the TIP directorate has a mission statement, which I've listed here on slide seven. And I've highlighted some words that I think are important and help me at least remember uh, this mission statement. We have three main elements to the mission statement. One is to advance critical and emerging technologies. We do that through both uh, basic use-inspired research as well as translational research and other programs that I'll describe in a moment. Um, in addition, though, to advancing those technologies, we want to address pressing societal and economic challenges, climate change, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uniform access and equitable access to capabilities. And then finally, we want to accelerate the translation of research results from lab to market. That phrase lab to market is important to really everything that we do as a directorate because we want to be able to get more out of the investments that we make in basic research to address societal challenges and economic challenges and solve problems for the benefit of our country and our taxpayers. We improve on our U.S. competitiveness. We grow the U.S. economy. We train a diverse workforce for the future uh, jobs that we have in, in emerging technologies and high technology in general. So there are a number of programs, and I'm going to walk through each one of these that uh, TIP executes to accelerate research towards impact. Uh, we have a regional innovation ecosystem program uh, that I'll describe. We have a convergence accelerator program. We have a number of experiential learning opportunities for the workforce of the future. We also are developing a number of translational pathways. You know, one of the ways that you typically describe what TIP as a directorate does is that we address that so-called valley of death. The valley of death exists between where basic research ends and commercialization and societal impact typically begin. What we're doing as a directorate is building pathways that enable new ideas, new innovations to get out of the lab, translate into the marketplace, and solve these problems for the benefit of our society. We also have what we refer to, refer to as a lab-to-market platform. These are par uh, programs that I'll uh, discuss in detail as we go through. i Partnerships for Innovation, our Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Program, all are focused on translating ideas out into the marketplace and enabling our engineering and science ecosystem to create new technologies and to commercialize those technologies that can address the societal needs that we have. Uh, we also are focused on emerging technologies, and we'll see that as we go through some of these programs, um, where these technologies such as artificial intelligence and, and human, uh, human machine interface and other types of activities um, uh, exist. And so accelerating research toward impact. We have three main ways that we do that. Uh, fostering and creating innovation and technology ecosystems. We have one division within TIP that is the Division of Innovation and Technology Ecosystems, ITE as we call it. Uh, the second element is establishing these translational pathways. Uh, that's the division that I'm a part of, which is the Division of Translational Impacts. Uh, we support startups uh, through our lab to market platform and focus on establishing these new pathways for translating research results out into commercialization and into society to have impact on society. And then finally, we partner with others, other federal agencies, uh, organizations throughout the, you know, the, the nation, um, you know, 
uh, even in internationally in some cases, but through a collection of public and private partnerships across all of the areas of science and engineering to enable us to achieve this goal of translating ideas from basic research to practice. I should mention at this point that uh, you know our, our goal with these partnerships is to enable us to to have more benefit than one agency alone can possibly achieve. So we partner with other federal agencies. As I mentioned, we partner with nonprofits. We partner with for-profits to actually uh, make progress towards not only the basic research that we conduct, but also the translation of that research into societal impact. If we look at our programs, and this is where we begin to dive deeply uh, into the programs that we conduct, the relationship between those programs, uh, the, the goals of each of the programs, and how you can uh, gain more information about each of these and potentially apply. And we certainly encourage that. I hope that you will, uh, as you learn more about our programs, uh, you know, join us by submitting a proposal. Uh, we welcome volunteers to review for our programs. So any engagement uh, that you'd like to suggest, we're open to. And so we encourage that. But our programs are uh, listed on this particular slide. We have what we refer to as America's Seed Fund, uh, which is the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Programs. Uh, most people don't realize that NSF actually created these programs, and then they spread to the remainder of the federal government over time. But both SBIR and STTR were created, uh, SBIR being in the 70s by NSF, uh, and STTR being in the early 80s by NSF, and then spreading to the remainder of the federal government. Uh, I will, when I talk about uh, our program in, with small businesses, uh, I'll describe what's unique about our program. Um, and, and uh, you know, it is very different in many ways from some of the other agencies, and I think that's important for everyone to understand. Uh, we also have and introduced a few years ago the Convergence Accelerator Program. Um, almost 10 years ago, we introduced the Innovation Core, so-called i -Core program. Uh, we have a translational research program that we refer to as Partnerships for Innovation. Uh, we just launched this most recent fiscal year, a program we call POSE, which is Pathways to Enable Open Source Ecosystems, because we realize that not everything is going to go into a commercial enterprise that uh, is a, a single company or an organization that's growing that particular pathway or that particular technology. In some cases, it's an open source environment that we work with, and we want to support that, and we are supporting that. And then finally, one of the largest programs that NSF has, has introduced in, in recent time is our Regional Innovation Ecosystem Program, so-called NSF Engines. And I'll describe uh, each of these programs uh, in, in a little bit more detail. So first, the Convergence Accelerator. The Convergence Accelerator is, uh, has several key characteristics associated with it. First of all, it is use-inspired research. What we mean by that is that uh, we are conducting research with a particular application or end use in mind driving that research as opposed to uh, discovery-based research, which, which is an open uh, view of, of, of uh, ideas and technology without a necessarily an end use in mind. Uh, the convergence accelerators have a problem uh, that they want to solve, and they have clear goals and milestones associated with those problems. The other thing that's key to the Convergence Accelerator program is that it is a multidisciplinary program. Our goal is to bring multidisciplinary teams together to support them to address a problem that needs basic and applied research to solve. Uh, we also are focused in this program on leveraging and, and addressing large national scale societal needs. This requires that we have a diverse partnership. Uh, we welcome industry, nonprofits, and academic organizations to actually be a part of the Convergence Accelerator Program. The, the other thing that's important about this program is it's a very different model of funding than NSF has historically used. Uh, we want to move faster. 
We want the teams to not only be funded faster, but then to conduct their research activities at speed and scale uh, in a way that uh, is, is unique uh, in comparison to previous decades at NSF. Uh, these are intentionally managed. We uh, have tracks that I'll describe in a moment um, and show you what those tracks are. But we have these uh, funded uh, entities that are working together as a cohort of teams. They cooperate. They compete. Uh, in addition to the research and the outcomes associated with that research, it's an intensive education process that is helping to develop the next generation of workforce as well. So the program structure, uh, two main phases. Uh, phase one is a planning phase. It's up to $750,000 over nine months. And this is really to, to build your team, to get new team members on board, to integrate the team into co a cohesive unit, and to actually develop a hands-on curriculum that can guide the work of that particular team. The second phase is where uh, the work gets implemented. Uh, it's where you actually do what you proposed uh, that you were going to do. And that's up to $5 million over 24 months. So these are fairly large awards, very aggressive, uh, You know, a, to a total of, of 33 months for these two phases um, and uh, almost $6 million to support the work. The goal is to create something that will impact society. We review proposals that come into this program, obviously using NSF standard uh, intellectual merit and broader impact review criteria, but we also have some very specific program criteria. Obviously, convergence, multiple disciplines coming together, experts from multiple institutions, a team that can address the particular problem, cross-cutting partnerships. We expect that industry, nonprofits, uh, uh, higher higher uh, institutions of higher education, research institutions are going to come together to work on this problem. And we expect that a prototype is going to come out of this uh, uh, this activity. We also want these teams to be uh, beneficial in broadening participation, bringing together groups that aren't not normally brought together uh, so that we can actually you know, broaden the, the capabilities that we bring to the table. They are focused on deliverables. So uh, unlike some basic research projects that are more open-ended, uh, the, the Convergence Accelerator Program is focused on clear deliverables. What can you do in three years? That's really important. And then alignment with our tracks. The tracks that we've been conducting in the Convergence Accelerator portfolio, uh, you can see listed uh, here uh, from 2019 when this program started, uh, through 2020, 2021, and now the current cohorts in 2022 are focused specifically on track H, I, and J, enhancing opportunities for persons with disabilities, as sustainable materials for global challenges, food and nutrition security, and continuing track G, which was focused on securely operating 5G infrastructure. We have not yet released uh, the next tracks in a future solicitation that will be forthcoming, uh, but tracks H, I, and J are currently being addressed in the, the solicitation that is published today. Uh, and I list here uh, the details associated with that. Uh, this is currently underway. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, it's, it, it's ongoing, but we do expect that this will continue and have an updated solicitation in the not too distant future. But some of the current key dates, uh, letters of intent were uh, submitted by June 1 of 2022. Full phase one proposals came in in July, and then full phase two proposals came in and uh, will come in in August. Uh, phase one uh, is required in order to submit for phase two. In other words, you must have a phase one proposal awarded in order to submit to the phase two program. And the phase two deadline again is in August of 2023. I've shown links to the solicitation so that you can actually learn more about the funding opportunities that exist here. Uh, and again, this is an ongoing solicitation, but I think you can learn a lot from this about what might be forthcoming in future solicitations for the program. 
The next program that I want to talk about is the NSF Regional Innovation Engines. Um, you know, this uh, program is a large scale program that focuses on grand challenges, be that climate change, equitable access, critical and resilient infrastructure. Uh, the en engines are regionally focused technology ecosystems, uh, and their technology focus can be one of many technologies. I've listed some examples here. It could be artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, semiconductors, and so forth. Uh, it's up for, it's up to the hub, in other words, the regional innovation engine, to determine the geography that it wants to include in its proposal, as well as the technology that it wants to include, as well as the grand or societal challenge that it's going to address. One of the things that's important uh, about the, the, the regional innovation engines, it, it's a large scale program. This is one of the largest programs NSF has done. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to $20 million per year for 10 years to fund a regional innovation engine. Our expectation is that they're gonna be in the approximate $16 million range, but it depends on the needs of the geography and the technology and the problem that's being focused upon. Our goal is, is that uh, it's a regional initiative. We want to support uh, partnerships. We want to support uh, the entrepreneurial activities and the development of innovative solutions to these problems that get quickly translated into commercialization so that the societal issues can be addressed and addressed directly. One of the interesting things about this, very unique for NSF, is that uh, we, after the letters of intent came in, we actually made available on our, our website, and you, you can see this exact image on our website. Uh, it's an interactive in, uh, image, so you can drill down and see uh, the, the letters of intent that have come from each state. Um, and so we had almost 700 submissions uh, that were put forward. Uh, with 520 submitting organizations involved in that, meaning some organizations are, are submitting more than one. Uh, states and U.S. territories, uh, 54 that were represented. Uh, and we have two types of engines. There's a type one proposal, which is essentially a planning grant. And this is for organizations or partnerships that are not quite ready to come forward for a full engine proposal uh, but they want to have a planning activity. And then finally, we have type two proposals, which are for a full regional innovation engine. And I'll show you some more details in just a moment on this. But uh, the point here is that you can go to our website. You can look at this map. You can drill down. You can identify organizations that are interested in pursuing this program. And hopefully you can reach out and perhaps become a team member as they go through the process of proposing uh, for one, one of the regional innovation engines. This really is just a summary of the key deadlines. And again, this is a program that's ongoing. So you can see the deadlines that are in the latter part of our fiscal year 2022. Uh, letters of intent, the end of August, full proposals, roughly the end of September, letters of intent uh, for type two in December, and type two full proposals in January. And so uh, there's a link to the solicitation so that you can study that and not only see what's currently ongoing, but hopefully get a sense for what would be coming in the future for this particular program. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit more about our lab to market platform. There are several elements to the lab to market platform. What we refer to as America's seed fund, as I mentioned earlier, that's our small business innovation research and small business technology transfer programs. Uh, we have a transition to practice program, uh, which is focused on demonstrating the the applicability of basic research to a practical problem and a societal need. Uh, that's uh, uh, an element, uh, as well as our Partnerships for Innovation, which is a translational uh, uh, element to translate ideas out of basic research. And then we have an educational component in this platform, which is our NSF i -Core. And I'll quickly go through each of these so that you can understand a little bit more about the program. First is i -Core. 
i core is uh as the name implies innovation core is focused on spurring translation but it's doing so in an entrepreneurial training activity uh, again i've shown a map of the uh, i core hubs that we've developed over the last couple of years we have 10 of them five that were funded in fiscal year 2021 five that were funded in our most recent fiscal year 2022 and announced in September of 2022. The focus of the i program is to train NSF-funded faculty, students, and others in innovation and entrepreneurship. What we find in startups coming out of our university community is that many of them fail because they create a product that the market does not want. They are enamored with the technology, but they have not figured out how to align the idea that they have with a market need. And so what i is all about is product market fit, developing a product description based on your fundamental research results and defining a value proposition that aligns with an industry need, a market need. And so the i program is an immersive seven-week training program that takes our, our faculty and students through um, a, a, an exercise that helps them identify if their idea coming out of basic research has market potential. They go through this training as a team. A team consists of three individuals. There's a technology lead, which is normally a faculty member. There's an entrepreneurial lead, which is normally a student. And then there's a mentor. And the mentor is someone who has done it before. They have the experience of having gone through this process. They are going to help guide this team through the training program, which is delivered by a set of experienced instructors that have been trained, uh, that have all been in the business uh, environment before, most with startup experience, but certainly all with industrial experience. So they know what it takes to get an idea out of the lab and into the marketplace. Since we've started this program, we've uh, funded more than 1,900 teams to go through the training. Out of those 1,900 teams, over 1,000 startups have been created. Uh, we deliver a re report every two years to Congress that describes the details of the, the progress that we've made on the i program. Those reports are publicly available, and I'd, I'd be happy to connect you to those uh, if you'd like to see more details on the results that we've seen so far since this program was launched in 2012. It's important to understand what i is and is not. It's not selling. It's not developing a business plan. It's not writing a grant. Uh, it's in, in fact, ideally, i is before you have started a company. What you're trying to determine is if your idea has merit that is worthy of, fun, of starting a company and whether or not you have a product idea that fits with the market need. One point I would make here is that, that if you are an experienced entrepreneur, uh, if you are someone that has done this before and you're listening in today, uh, please volunteer to be a mentor. That's one of our challenges is finding enough qualified people to serve as mentors for the teams that we support. The next is our translational research program, Partnerships for Innovation. We fund teams that have previously been funded by NSF with basic research. The goal is to translate the results of that basic research into uh, or closer to commercialization. So we support the teams to develop a proof of concept prototype, to develop a proof of concept experiment, to potentially um, you know, develop a, 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 an understanding of whether the idea is scalable, uh, and it, you know, it's really focused on helping them move the technology further down the path to the point where they understand if they have something that can be commercially viable. Um, this does not require, in fact, we prefer that it not have a small business yet. We want the team to discover if a small business is, is uh, something that they should pursue. 
One of the other things that's important about all of our programs is we support all of the National Science Foundation. So we are open to any technology area that is covered by NSF. And so that's important to remember, not only about PFI, but also about all of the programs that we conduct for the foundation. Uh, these programs, the PFI program, can be funded at up to $500,000 for up to 36 months to conduct these activities. We introduced this year an open source ecosystem program. We refer to this as POSE. The, the idea, the goal is to harness the power of open source development for the creation of new technology solutions. The POSE program is not funding research. What we are funding is the creation of a platform that can enable the, the, uh, the, the pathway to produce an open source solution. So we really are trying to support the development of an open, open source ecosystem. Uh, we awarded approximately 25 phase one awards uh, this past fiscal year in September of this year. And those are for $300,000 for one year. And it's essentially a planning grant. You're scoping out the activities. You're determining what needs to be done uh, and developing a well thought out and a sustainable plan for your open source ecosystem. And then phase two is two years to support the transition of this research product that you've created out of basic research into a sustainable open source ecosystem. Phase two is up to 1.5 million for up to two years. And phase two proposals were submitted just last week. Uh, the deadline was October, um, October 21st. And so those proposals are currently in and currently in our review process. And finally, America's Seed Fund, our Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Program. I want to emphasize something that's unique to NSF, and it's important to understand as you think about pursuing uh, SBIR funding. Different agencies conduct these programs in different ways. There are two things that are unique about NSF. One is that we're not developing a product that we, NSF, will consume. So unlike NASA or the Department of Defense that has problems they need to solve in order to uh, conduct their mission, they need to develop solutions to those specific problems and ultimately, uh, hopefully, have products that they will acquire. NSF is not uh, developing products for our own acquisition. What we want to do is to support the startup community. So we provide up to $2 million in research and development funding for transformative, deep technology, high impact uh, uh, companies that have a great innovative technology, but they have technical risks that they need to mitigate through an R&D program. So we're open to any technologies that are served by NSF. So again, all of the engineering and science communities uh, that NSF supports can apply to uh, have their company funded by our seed fund. And our goal is we want to be the very first money that company gets. We want to fund the company before they become uh, attractive to the private sector, because we believe that's a gap or a niche that we can serve, is we can put money into companies when they have technology risk at a time when a private sector investment would not put money into that. <clears throat> so our goal is to transform these scientific discoveries <clears throat> into products and services that have a significant societal in, uh, impact. We do this in phases. Phase one is feasibility research up to $275,000 for up to 12 months. Phase two is prototype development, typically. That's where you actually implement the solution that you've developed in phase one, up to a million dollars for 24 months. And then phase two is focused on incentivizing the private sector to come on board with this risky technology because we've funded, we NSF have funded the de-risking of it. So to incentivize third-party investment, we will provide in what we call phase 2B up to $500,000 to match a private or third-party investment. 
And that's 50 cents of NSF dollar on each dollar from the third party investment. So if you raise a million dollars, you can get $500,000 from NSF as a matching uh, component of that investment, incentivizing the private or third party investment to occur so that we can actually get these companies off and succeeding uh, without need for further funding from the National Science Foundation. We've been operating this program for 40 years. We've had some phenomenal successes. Uh, we funded Qualcomm, for example, when they were a, a startup company. We funded Symantec, a cybersecurity company, when they were a startup company. So we've had some real uh, well-known successes, including very recent ones, such as Ginkgo Bioworks, which is a synthetic biology company that came out of uh, basic research that NSF supported and is now a publicly traded company. So just a couple of examples of successes. Some statistics on the program, you can see the, the, the areas in which we've made investments in companies. Uh, but again, we serve all of the science and engineering disciplines that NSF supports. Some additional statistics, uh, again, just to illustrate the startup mentality that we're focused on. 95% of the, the companies that we fund have 10 or fewer employees. 81% are founded within the past five years, and almost 60% are getting SPIR and STTR uh, money for the first time. Uh, we track our, our companies once we support them. We provide mentoring and training and support along the way. Uh, so it's not just fund them and forget them. We actually provide uh, you know, support to them along the way so that they can uh, become uh, trained and better educated on how to build a successful uh, startup. And then we track the follow-on funding that they receive. And you can see um, in the, in the uh, we've had over 200 successful exits in the five years of this data from 2016 to 2021. And during that period, uh, over $14 billion in follow-on institutional financing of the companies that we've supported. So we're very proud of this program. We think it's a great program. It fills a gap. Uh, and so ultimately, what we would love to see is NSF-funded basic research that can transition into our translational program, PFI, can transition into our i program for an entrepreneurial training exercise, and then ultimately result in a startup company that can come into our SBIR and STTR uh, uh, program. And so here's an example, uh, NanoView Biosciences, uh, and, and this is a biomarker uh, co-localization uh, through fluorescence company or technology. Uh, this started as an NSF career award uh, that was funded in 1996. They received a PFI award in 2011. Uh, they then were able to go through i in 2013. They received a Phase One award in 2017, a Phase Two award uh, in, in 2018. And in 2020, they were able to raise over $15 million in a, a private uh, financing round. So this is, a, this is just a, one example of what we would love to see in the programs. And this is a good example, I think, of that pathway from basic research to societal impact. And so I'd like to invite you to learn more about TIP. Uh, you can go to our website uh, and visit us. You can reach out to me uh, if you'd like. Uh, my email address is bwjohnso at nsf.gov. I invite you to reach out to me. Uh, please um, uh, hopefully stay around and ask questions. I'd be delighted to interact with you in the live portion of this. Uh, but thank you for uh, listening in. Thank you for participating. Uh, and please reach out. Please learn more about our programs. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and you can see a general tip contact uh, as well. But hopefully you also now have my email address. I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, 
Barry did answer some questions in the chat. We've got about 10 minutes left to answer some, some additional questions. So please send those to us in the Q&A and, and we'll go ahead and answer them. Uh, the first one, Barry, that you can also see here is from uh, Natalia and she is um, saying that her university is not designated uh, a NSF Innovation Core. Um, and she's looking for how she can access training if, if you know, if, if her institution doesn't already have one of these um, awards, I suppose, or programs. Yeah, we have um, uh, we have ten I Corps hubs that are located across the country. Uh, each of those hubs has a minimum of eight universities, so and some have more. So there are approximately 100 universities that are engaged in the program. Um, some of them are, as the question implies, some of them are focused exclusively on you know, the people within those universities, but others are not. And so what I would encourage you to do is to send me an email. I actually provided that in the uh, presentation as well as in the uh, Q&A uh, you can send me an email and I can uh, connect you to a university that uh, does uh, provide their training to those that are not within their own system. So happy to help. OK, great. And uh, the next question is asking if TIP is looking uh, to hire program directors and what are some of the expected qualifications? And perhaps maybe uh, you want to touch on our uh the rotator program that NSF has. Um, Absolutely. We, we do have multiple openings within our uh, TIP programs. For example, we're looking for program directors for POSE, the Pathways to Enable Open Source Ecosystems, uh, SBIR, STTR, um, i uh, the Innovation Core, uh, the Engines Program, Convergence Accelerator Program, essentially all of our programs. Uh, probably the only one that we don't have any vacancies in right now is the Partnerships for Innovation Program, PFI. Um, we hire individuals in multiple ways. One is with, the, as Jeremy indicated, the Rotator Program. Uh, this is officially the Intergovernmental Personnel Act program. I, I'm actually a so-called IPA. Uh, NSF provides a grant to my home institution that uh, covers my salary and benefits. And, and as part of that grant agreement, my home institution agrees to allow me to work full time on NSF activities. And so that's one mechanism. Uh, we also hire federal employees. Um, you know, it, the tip um uh, requirements are uh, explicitly different than you might see in other divisions uh, and directorates across NSF because we uh, are focused on you know translation. We're focused on startups, and so for example, um, a, a PhD is not a requirement in order to be a program director. Uh, what we look for is experience in the in the the realm of of the activity that you would be coming into. If it's I core that it's entrepreneurial experience. If it's SBIR, it's startup experience as well, building a company type experience. So uh, again, you can send me an email. Uh, I can uh, provide more information. Uh, happy to have a, a quick call with you to do that as well. So please feel free to reach out. Great. And Natalia is following up with how how can her institution become, uh, I guess, an i hub or or get involved with uh, in other ways with i -Corps? Actually, it's a great question. Uh, you know, th there are a couple of things I would encourage you to look for. Uh, I mentioned those 10 hubs that we have, uh, each one having a minimum of eight universities. But in addition, each hub is required to add a new partner, at least one new partner each year over the next five years. So those 10 hubs are going to be adding at least 50 additional partner institutions. And so I would encourage you to reach out to one of the leaders of the hubs. If you have any trouble connecting with them, contact me, I'll connect you to them. Uh, but that would be a great way to have a conversation with them on how you might be able to engage as a, as an organization. And so, um, I think that, um, you know, that would be, you know, the, the best thing to do in terms of connecting with the i -Corps program. Okay. Uh, TIP is for sure always looking for reviewers for its programs. How would you suggest people uh, become a reviewer in, in, a, in the programs that you've talked about today? 
think there are a couple of things you can do. One is I would encourage you to look at our website where you'll find the program directors that are involved in each program. Their contact information is given there. If you have interest in a specific program, uh, you could send an email to one of those program directors and let them know that you're interested. Uh, if you have trouble finding you know, a, a good match in your mind, you can always reach out to me and I'll, I'll uh, any information you can provide me on your background, whether it's a resume or a LinkedIn page or any anything of that sort, that'll help me determine if there's a good match for you and, and our programs. And I can make that uh, that match occur. Okay. And here's a, a question, uh, I guess, following up on uh, what you said about program officers, not necessarily having to have a, a, a PhD, but um, I guess that this question from, from Leah is asking is do they require them to be faculty or practitioners in uh, industry, government, and nonprofit, ex yeah, nonprofit no, experience? Yeah, we do not require them to be faculty members. Uh, you know, the the um, uh, you know uh, program directors, for example, in our small business program, it, it's more important to have small business expertise. Uh, we do need technical expertise. I mean, we we um, you know we want to see that there's uh, you know that expertise as well, but it doesn't have to be a PhD. It doesn't need to be a faculty member. Um, you know, it's it's uh, explicitly open more broadly than that. And so again, uh, happy to communicate with you via email or set up a Zoom call and have a quick conversation uh, if that'll be helpful. But you know, we are intentionally much broader because our mission is broader. Our mission is is getting these ideas out into societal impact, and that takes a skill set that is um, yeah not always completely um, encapsulated in in a PhD. <laughs> so I would encourage you to to um, reach out and let's see if there's a good opportunity. Okay, um, we still have a couple of minutes. If you want to put some questions into the, the Q&A. Um, also, I'll mention that this presentation is available on the conference website, so you can go there and uh, take a look at it. Um, you can look at the presentation and also view the view the video as well. Um, and I I'm want to you. Yeah. I'm sorry, Jerry. I, no, I no, go ahead. Uh, I mean, every every program that I mentioned has uh, has a web page uh, that gives you a little bit more information. It also has links to the most recent uh, solicitation. So if you have interest in submitting a proposal, you can go to the website and find that. Uh, um, some of the programs that I mentioned have uh, proposals that are just coming in right now. So we haven't necessarily uh, release the next solicitation, but you know we do that on a regular basis, um, and so I can't comment on exactly when that will be. But you can see from our history that we've released new solicitations essentially every fiscal year uh, for these programs, and so uh, please check back and and find out when the next one is coming up. Yeah, and one of the things you can do is you can sign up to receive notifications um, of uh, of programs. You can select just to hear about programs from TIP, or you can customize it however you want uh, to to the information that you want to receive and when you want to receive it. So you can do that on the NSF website. Uh, last last question here: um, Are there, does TIP have programs that particularly that that um, target uh, community colleges? We do. We have uh, a program that we just launched called Excellent, and it's a it's a workforce development program, and it's it is indeed focused on engaging with community colleges and and uh, you know getting getting workers trained for uh, emerging and future jobs. Um, and so, I would encourage you to look at that as well. We we are very open to more engagement with community colleges, and and certainly um, are looking for more ways that. We can engage. So if you if you are at a community college and have interest in in having a conversation, please reach out as well. Uh, but we do have some. We've also had um, uh, in the past internship programs that would place community college students at some of our small businesses that we're funding, and so uh, a number of different activities that we have, uh, you know, that are focused on the community college sector as well. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank you, Barry, for a great presentation and thank 
Thanks to all of you for joining us uh, for this session today. I want to also um, mention that um, we have more sessions today at coming up at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Eastern time for more uh, NSF directorate-led uh, sessions. We hope to see you there and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much, everyone.